Welcome back. I hope you're feeling energized as we still have a lot more knowledge to share. It's great to see you all getting involved in what the platform has to offer. All the content from today will be available to view on demand within 24 to 48 hours. So don't worry if you've missed something earlier, there's plenty of time to catch up. So let's get right back into our panel discussions and our next one will be focusing on modern ticketing systems. And once again, we'll circulate back to the customer being at the forefront of redesign encourage the public back to rail following the drop due to the pandemic. Under the umbrella of modern ticketing, there are two focus areas, ticketing and fares, to make journeys more straightforward in an area that really matters to the customer. Investment needs to be made to improve the clarity and ease of planning a journey and buying a ticket, ultimately affecting millions of passengers' rail travel experience. Online and mobile ticketing, pay-as-you-go, integrated ticketing across multimodal transport and flexible season options will be considered as potential solutions to the difficulties currently experienced in the ticketing world. Don't forget, during this debate, if you've got a question, you can go to the live Q&A button on the right hand of your screen. And once we get going, I'll have a look at your questions. So to discuss this topic, I'm delighted to be joined by Mike Tuckett, Head of Customer Payments at Transport for London, Mark Fagan, Business Development Director at Fujitsu, Mark Anderson, Commercial and Customer Director, Go Ahead, and Duncan Henry, Retail Strategy Director, Customer Directorate at the Rail Delivery Group. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being our panelists this afternoon. Um, Mike Fagan, we've got, sorry, Mark Fagan, we've got two Marks, it's very confusing, two Marks and a Mike, thank goodness for a Duncan, hey? Um, Mark Fagan, before we delve um, deeply into ticketing and fares, how have uh, you at uh, Fujitsu supported the workforce through the pandemic and um, how do you expect things to change in the longer term? Yeah, um, thanks for the question, Helen. I guess like most modern employers, um, the priority was the safety and well-being of, of the employees, which was the, you know, the priority for the business. Um, in our organisation, there was no furlough, a lot of support um, for people to work from home straight away and not just technical support. Um, we were blessed that, you know, um, working for an IT company, we had the infrastructure in order to do that. But, but I mean, we had over 20,000 people work from home on day one um, with no real change to the, the functionality of the business. Because we support a lot of um, critical national infrastructure, we still had a, a need for a lot of people to be able to work in the field, either on customer sites or in offices as well. So getting that balance right of getting the right amount of people into the offices and the right amount of people working from home. But then looking after people's well-being, I think, was, became the very important thing to do as people were then working from home for a long period of time. So things like carers leave, where they, they gave everyone five days additional leave to take off to, to manage any additional care duties that they had. Um, and and a, a, you know, a, a, a process called Work Your Way, where they, they allowed us to adapt our working hours to, to be able to fit around you know, people who were looking after kids, looking after elderly parents, etc. So a lot of people working split shifts and things like that as well. So so very, very flexibly. Um, and I think that was great because it allowed Fujitsu to, to offer that level of support to our customers too. So we had a lot of customers who then needed that level of support from Fujitsu. So we were able to go out to the market for a lot of our customers and support them, getting people working from home as well. So it was kind of like eating our own dog food, as, as we say in this industry. So a lot of... Um, you know, a lot of good work in there to support both the Fujitsu staff but Fujitsu's customers as well. So I think that's that's been great. And, and obviously going forward, I think, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk here about what the new normal will be. From our perspective, obviously, there's going to be that hybrid working going forward for, for most people. Um, we've done a bit of work within Fujitsu to look at, you know, hubs rather than offices. So, you know, an office is no longer a place to go and sit at a desk from nine to five. It's a place to go and meet people. So physically changing the workspace and stuff like that to enable better collaboration when you go there. And obviously less travel, which is kind of, um, you know, the antithesis of what we're talking about here on this session. But but obviously there's a lot of, you know, a lot less need for people to travel on a regular basis just to go to meetings and stuff like that. So finding that balance where you, you do still need to travel, you do still need to sit face to face with people and collaborate, whether that be internally or with customers, um, and balancing that with a, a good working from home life and, and, and being able to get you know get that um, good work life balance. Mark Anderson, I mean, Mark's right, isn't he, that there is a, a new normal going on and we're all adapting and finding out what that new normal looks like. But how critical is passenger experience or, or CX? Mm. 
Yeah, thank, thanks, Helen. Um, yeah, I think much of uh, uh, what's been said already resonates with me. Um, and I think that the, the passenger experience has never been more important. If we're going to uh, restore confidence in the railway, attract passengers back, which is absolutely what we need to do, um, and to continue to drive uh, modal shift from, from the car, we need to focus more closely than ever on, on the needs of, of passengers. Um, so uh, to that extent, I, th I think it, it's so important that any conversation around retail and ticketing begins with what passengers want. And I think that we as an industry just need to work much harder at understanding really forensically how uh, our passengers use want to use the railway in the future um, and, and how ticketing fits into that. We know that it's hugely complex um, and this feels to me like a really good place to start to try and rebuild confidence in rail and get passengers back. So finding out what people want, I mean, I suppose that's the insight gathering, isn't it? An analysis mm. that's important to do before you make the investment, presumably in the in the retail systems. Yeah, you know, I think in um, whether it's products we're designing or whether it's services, we have to begin by listening to passengers, understanding what it is that they want from the railway before we even start to think about what our solution looks like. So I, I, I would like to see you know, really robust insight gathering at an early stage bef before we do anything else. Um, I mean, I think we, we ought to think more broadly as well. And, and when we're looking at insight, let's really dig deep into the passenger journey and understand what are the, um, the ad adjacent products and services that our passengers are buying along with rail tickets. Because if we can pull together, you know, first and last mile, car parking, the whole kind of door to door piece into, into one ticket, then I think we're going to start to deliver the kind of convenience and that seamless ticketing experience that I believe um, passengers are looking for. Duncan, reconfiguring a decades old system, I would imagine, is certainly not going to be easy. What do you think are the challenges, uh, you know, as well as finding out what passengers want, but in terms of implementing the fare and ticketing re recommendations that are in the William Shapps plan? Well, I think Mark makes some good points about we need to know what the customer really wants. And uh, actually, we've already done quite a lot of that work um, already. We have a very good um, sample size, nearly 20,000 respondents on a piece of work around fares and ticketing that RDG did a couple of years ago. Um, and actually, it's quite clear what customers want. They just want it to be simple, easy, quick. They don't actually want ticketing to dominate their day. They just want to make a, a transaction that they have confidence in and that they've paid the right fare. Uh, and actually, that's that's very similar to some of the stuff I think we might hear from, uh, from Mike Tucker uh, about what's been done on the on the TFL network. Um, the William Shapps paper very clearly lays out that there's, a, there's an aspiration to, to pay as you go. That's supported by all of the research that we've done uh, that customers absolutely want to deliver, uh, want us to deliver pay as you go. But that's gonna take time and effort. And, and as you say, it's not gonna be easy. Um, part of that is, is the systems, but a lot of it is also to do with, with how the uh, the fares structures, the commercial structures, the revenue is really affected by those kinds of products and understanding what the impact is going to be and making sure that we, uh, we account for those and that there are, uh, there are very clear boundaries over, over who's responsible for each of those, uh, those aspects and that, um, and that it's affordable and sustainable as we move forward. We're all up against it in terms of, uh, in terms of our budgets, in terms of the the finances of the railway, the number of customers we have. So we're going to have to be careful to make sure we make the right choices as we move into the future and, and deliver some of these solutions that customers are, have been asking us for quite some time, actually. Duncan, um, Mike, rather, Duncan's given you a, a nice introduction there. You're head of payments at TFL and uh, as a huge underground customer, um, the Oyster system and contactless payment system works really well. Can you give us a bit of an insight into the changes that TFL made and what you think the key challenges might be that lie ahead for railways based on your experience of implementing and running this kind of solution in the capital? 
Yeah, sure. Um, because I mean, I, I think um, what, what's in the William Schatz review is very close to what we've done over the last 18 years. And it's not really a good excuse why the rail industry is so far behind, but at least the vision is there now and we're very, very um, supportive of that. Um, and I think page ago, which is really what I know about because of, you know, that's really the heart of how Oyster and Contactless work in London. Um, we've seen a huge revenue increase from it. We've seen a huge cost reduction from it. The revenue increase comes essentially because you focus on, uh, I guess, really removing the obstacle to people choosing public transport. And the cost savings come because you focus on removing really unnecessary process steps um, and challenge the whole notion of needing a, a ticket. Um, and I think the point of this in the context of this discussion is um, if you don't do that in a way where you focus on the customer proposition, putting the customer first, you will not get those benefits. Just you know, just doing a pay-as-you-go scheme is not enough. You, you have to really focus on um, making customers trust it, making customers want to, to choose it. And, and that's really the heart, I think, of, of how we've done things in, in London. If, if I could just in 30 seconds tell one very quick sort of story to illustrate it, which will sound probably slightly critical of the rail industry, but please trust me, it's done in a, in a, in a constructive sense. I was recalling when we um, rolled out Oyster Pay to go in 2010 to the London train operating companies. This was before we even had the idea of letting people use bank cards and mobile phones you know, to do Pay to go. Um, it was a big debate actually with the talks in London because they wanted to introduce a uh, what I thought was a very complicated thing. It was called an oyster extension permit. I won't go into the details of it, but it was a thing that took a lot of explanation to customers and it was to address a, quite a, a real but a very narrow field risk. Yeah. Our view from the TFL experience is you are undermining the whole notion of pay as you go then, making it too complicated. It won't work. And that could be right. You know, within a year it was withdrawn because it was proven that I think it was 80% of people who were buying it didn't even need it, so it was clearly misunderstood. Yeah. But the general story, yeah, I think, is don't see the big picture. Um, you will get the cost savings, you will get the revenue benefits, but only if you um, sweep away some of the things that you hold on to dear. And um, you, you have to be a little bit brave in saying, yeah, okay, maybe there is a little bit of a fraud there, um, but actually, the thing overall is right. and. I absolutely have to keep it simple for customers. Well, I think good good advice. There. Everybody's nodding. Uh, Mark Fagan, how do you think modern ticketing, you know, perhaps like we've seen an example of at TFL, can encourage more people um, to use the railways? Well, I think it's quite simple. I mean, the, you know, as has been alluded to here by some of the colleagues, you know, the, the, the existing um, ticketing and, and fares infrastructure is massively complicated in rail. Um, historically, um, I think that's got more convoluted by the change in hybrid working where people have, have got different demands to that product set that's already there. So the product set itself would only just get more complicated. So, you know, you know, the William Sharp report is, is said very clearly that there has to be a modernisation in, you know, ticketing um, and, and fares. And, that, and I think that's that's what needs to happen. How we go about doing that, you know, the example that we've just delivered is, is flexi scenes where you know if i was being honest it's just the start i don't i think one of my colleagues mentioned at the call earlier on it's just the start it's not where we need to be but it's the start of a long road to, to get there to what that you know people are demanding in, in the modern world so more products like flexi seasons and um, to cover more and more um use cases where people have got very very different working patterns and again i think it was mentioned earlier if we tried to put everyone in the, the same boat or bucket as the analogy was was made earlier on um, you know, it, it's very difficult to, to, to lump. There's so many people with so many different requirements, and, and that's why the, the fears have got as complicated as they are. But so I think trying to find a way to simplify them, but to be able to still cover the bulk of people and their, their work patterns and their leisure patterns as well now is becoming even more important. So how we do that as an industry getting together, um, I think we've got to to do that, we've got to put the customer experience at its at its heart. As, as people have, have mentioned there, we need to you know remove cash from from the network as much as we possibly can. Both you know because it's slow and costly, but also unhygienic in lots of places as well. But other things in the industry like the accelerate the removal of the existing mag stripe stuff that's been there for thirty or forty years. 
you know, support for the levelling up agenda as well. We need to get people able to make, you know, local, regional and national journeys as well. And, and not, you know, um, again, not trying to denigrate what's happening in TfL, but for various reasons, what's happened in TfL is difficult to replicate in the rest of the UK as well in its entirety. So, so there, there's, you know, a very complex area. There are certainly things that we think we can do as an industry, but it's going to take the whole industry to work together and collaborate um to, to move this forward mark anderson you're nodding away there yeah. i mean running both um, rail and bus operations what comparisons can you draw about that shift to digital ticketing and the decline of cash payments yeah you know, I, I um i agree with with both mark and mike i mean you know rail fares and ticketing is hugely complex and at the moment, we expect a lot of our passengers. We expect them to understand the fares available to them. And we don't always make it really easy for them to understand. So when I look to our uh, bus businesses, um, we've invested heavily in uh, in smart card technology and in tap on, tap off. Um, to the extent that now the ease of buying a ticket is one of the main drivers of satisfaction for bus users. So we know that that simplicity and that seamless um, uh, ease of just getting onto a um, is, is making a big difference. And I think that is what is going to help us um, improve modal share for rail. Um, you know, dealing with the complexity that, that exists and really focusing on complete simplicity and ease for passengers. So I think the challenge for us as an industry is not importing the existing complexity into any new innovation. And I, I, I say that I know that's a huge challenge, but I think it's really important that we um, we address that if we're really going to focus on, on the passenger experience. Duncan, I'd, I'd consider myself a sort of modern woman. I'm not great on technology and stuff, but I know that, you know, you're probably quite keen on getting rid of the paper ticket and it's taken me a while to get rid of the paper ticket because even when I've had it in my wallet on my phone, I've been nervous about not having that printout in my bag if my phone goes down. Is it true that you do want to get rid of paper tickets? And if that is the case, how are we going to make sure that particularly perhaps older people who aren't as au fait with smart technology don't feel left out? Yeah, look, we, we recognise that, that people want to engage with the rail industry in lots of different ways and that the paper ticket has been around forever, essentially, 200 years of paper ticketing. Um, that's a long time. And, and, uh, and, and do we want to, to move away from the current mag stripe technology? Yes, we do. Do we want to get rid of... Um, paper tickets altogether. No, for those customers who, who really want a paper ticket, then there are solutions out there. And, and they're, uh, they're cheaper for us as an industry and they're better for them because they've got um, devices on there, things that allow us to, to track and, and check that ticket and make sure that that ticket is a, is a valid ticket and, uh, and advise them if there's some issue on their, on their service. So, you know, there's, there's a there's a a move towards online, but we're not we're not going to sweep away the paper tickets for for those who really need them or or really want them for a particular reason. Um, but yes, we want to move to an online modern uh, architecture because the vast majority of our customers tell us that's where they want to buy the ticket, that's where they want us to deliver the ticket to them, uh, and they're voting with their feet. So the the uh, the paper ticket that we that we do is now less than half of what we produce. Um, that's declined significantly through COVID, and it's clear that that buying an online ticket that's delivered to your mobile phone with a barcode on it, or to your smart card that, that is picked up as you pass through the gate, uh, is a much more hygienic, much more convenient way for customers to to engage and to do that uh, that transaction with us. And that's where we're going to take the industry over the next few years. We're, we're looking very much to um, to move away from a physical piece of paper. It's, it's quite archaic, actually, if you think about what we do. Yeah, um, and it's, move it's, towards... It's archaic in the rest of our world now, isn't it? We tap into all sorts of different places in, you know, not just... I'm not just thinking about travel, but, you know, going to the cinema or doing different things. It's all about sort of tapping in and... I think as well, COVID, you know, not that I'm a great fan of not having a, a menu in a cafe or anything, but we, we're sort of a bit more of a barcode society in um, in mm. some ways. Um, Mike, I was just wondering, 
you know, we mentioned trust there when you talk about pay as you go. And, you know, I have ultimate trust. If I think about it, I tap in to the tube and I'm, I feel 100% confident that I'm going to be charged the right fare. And I don't know whether that's naivety or not. But what are the critical criteria of pay as a pay as you go scheme from the customer's perspective? Yeah, but you have to work really hard, I think, to, to gain them, um, keep that trust. And, you know, it is a focus of ours. And I think, you know, the, probably the biggest thing of all is the fares. Um, and I don't know if this kind of rings true for you, Helen, but you, you need to know, don't you, that there's, by using pay as you go, you're not missing out on, on something that's there that's better. Yeah. And, we, and if this is really, I think, the big challenge for National Rail is you have to get the fares in a state where you can say, yeah, pay as you go is you can trust it to be the best value. Um, we have to work our fares to that position over a number of years, and you've got to go through that same journey. Um, so, for instance, when Mark was saying earlier, you know, flexi tickets are the start and, and, a, and a good thing, I would challenge that slightly and say, no, in an urban environment, you're only doing that because you haven't got the pay-to-go system. Um, that can cope with it and, and make things best valued. Yeah, so, so in London, um, for instance, someone who was only travelling two days a week would use pay as you go, um, and because of capping and because we've set the fare to be, you know, the daily cap to be one fifth of the weekly amount, you find you know you're just as well off as buying a weekly travel card. So that kind of challenge of saying, yeah, you know, the, the benefits of pay as you go where it can be used are massive. But you can't have it always. You have to sweep away some of these alternatives and complications. The, the, the heart of trust is saying, yep, yeah, I know that I'm going to get the best fare when I just touch my card on that reader. I'm just um, looking at the side of my screen and uh, we've got quite a lot of questions coming in. So these are new to me. So do feel free to try and work out as we go along who would be best to answer them. Let's start off with Joanna. Um, does the rail industry spend too much time thinking and not enough time experimenting to find what works and what customers like? Well, I, I think I can answer that question and, and it's absolutely on point. We need to be much more innovative as, a, as an industry. We need to be prepared to take some risks and customers need to run with us on some of this stuff. So, so customers need to be prepared to, uh, to maybe face a little bit of inconvenience or difference or change. Um, but yes, we, we should be much more comfortable with, uh, with taking a little bit more risk, being a bit more innovative, putting things into the, the public domain and taking them out again if they don't work, not worrying that, oh my goodness, it hasn't worked, that's a catastrophe. It's not. Actually, we put it there to see if it would work. It didn't. We now know that it doesn't. And that's okay. That's part of the innovation process. Well, Mike sort of yeah. proved that, that you were agreeing with that, uh, Mark Anderson. Yeah, I, I, that's a great question. I agree with Duncan. Um, uh, we run an innovation program at Go Ahead, and we meet a lot of startups and scale ups who want to provide solutions and innovation in this space. But then because of the complexity that exists, we often find ourselves putting barriers in the way of that. And we really need to fix that if we're going to move forward. So um, again, it just goes back to my earlier point about uh, not inheriting the, this legacy that, uh, of, of complexity that exists and really being focused on, on trialing stuff and, and getting proof of concepts out to customers. So I, I would really endorse that view. Claudio, carry on that. Yeah, just from a supplier point of view to the industry, I think it was mentioned earlier, I think there's a duty on us as suppliers to be challenging back to the industry, both to the tops and, and to the central organisations as a supplier to say there are different ways to do this. And, and you know, I think we, we've pushed quite hard in the past and continue to do so in a challenging way to say we want to pilot stuff. We want, you know, we have to fail fast. We have to learn the lessons and then adapt and improve and innovate. And, and that's how we will drive innovation and as and as Duncan said sometimes that's going to come at a cost you know you might take some backward steps but you know you will learn from them and, and that will allow you to move forward elsewhere so I think there's good I think we're going to see um a bit of that in the next couple of years as, as GBR tried to do um you know introduce you know changes you know as I, I touched on earlier on in line with something like flexi season I think already people are talking about how a flexi season could be adapted and improved and I think that's a good thing. We've learned quickly from it and we will adapt. 
I think as well, never is there going to be a better time to test the public on all this because we've had to be agile and we've had to adapt. You know, who on earth had even heard of a Zoom before lockdown? So it's a good time. I think the public are willing to be a bit more open to change right now. Claudio makes um, a good point uh, and wants to know what is the panel opinion on a system like the Dutch OV chip cart, which essentially works as a pay as you go national Oyster card, allowing travel on all train operators, all public transport operators, and national rail cycle hire. That sounds like they're, well, that sounds like they're very joined up over there. But what do we think to that? Could that work in Britain? Can I chip in, Helen, first on that? So, so I think um, yes, certainly what we found is since we launched the possibility for people to pay with their um, bank cards and, and e.g. Apple Pay and, and, and Google Pay directly, that's become by far the most popular. So on the underground now, over half of all journeys are you know, made by people paying in that way. It's the biggest single way of paying. So you know, once you've got that, that does sort of become the potential for a national basis because it's, it's an open standard you know everyone's got a, a bank card and in london say you can use that same contactless card to tap on the bike hire terminal and rent a bike so it's sort of quite a long way i think for that sort of um system the one caution i would say is if we're imagining um an oyster equivalent for for anything other than local um suburban travel it does get problematic because you get to a position where really a cust you know, the customer feeling, I think, is they'd rather have the certainty of having bought something in advance. And it's a little bit frightening, maybe say, oh, I could touch in and touch out for a fare of £50 from Birmingham to Newcastle or something like that. Um, so I think it just, you know, there are some limitations on saying, yeah, you could have a complete nationwide system like there is in London. It's, well, actually, Peter says here, if you buy a ticket that covers a route operated by a number of companies, they all get a share of the revenue. Can the same principle be applied to non-railway companies like taxi, bike, rental buses, etc.? Just a, that's a slight different take on the same kind of question, isn't it? It is, but I'm, I'm actually not a big fan of the, the way that the revenue is shared out at the moment. There's a, uh, it, it doesn't incentivize the right kinds of commercial behaviors from, from our, our members always. Um, and that's an, that's an interesting challenge that we've had for a long time. So that the system that runs it uh, has been with us since privatization in the 90s. Um, and I don't think this is how it works elsewhere. So we, we possibly need to think about how we move from, from that, that blind sharing out of, of revenue to something which would incentivize uh, a real laser focus on customer outcomes and make sure that we're, we're really focused on what the customer wants as a, as a group of organizations that provide rail. Andre says, how much effort is being applied to explore regional and national fare zone structures to better support simplicity, more attractive fares, and use of smart cards and phone apps? Yeah, I mean, I can I can pick up on, on some of this. Uh, from the fares perspective, uh, Rail Delivery Group have been pushing for rail, uh, simplification of rail ticketing and, and fares for a long time. Uh, we have about 55 million different fares in the UK, uh, and to navigate that from a customer's perspective is mind-boggling. It really is, um, but it's not simple for us as an industry to to set our own fares, or it hasn't been until until relatively uh, un until maybe GBR will allow us to do that. Um, we we face uh, regulation of fares. There's a lot of control coming out of Westminster, and, and to be fair, out of some of the devolved um, governments as well. Uh, and so we as an industry don't have full control over exactly what fares we offer or how we offer them. Uh, and so we need to have uh, some regulatory reform. We need to look at how we reduce the, the number of fares, the complexity of fares, uh, in order to provide some of those, those flexible services that customers have been asking for for a long time. Mark Fagan, what do you see as the biggest challenge that we face as we begin to encourage more people back to the railways and try and get back to some kind of normal, albeit a new normal? Uh, I think they've been covered at, at different points through through this chat, Helen. I think passenger confidence, without a doubt, is the single biggest biggest problem. You know, there was a, the whole process of um, people being encouraged to use their, their car 
you know, during the pandemic. So getting those people back out of cars and back onto public transport one way or another is, is a huge um, challenge for the industry and something we've got to focus on. So I think that would be it. Um, you, you tie that into what we've talked about, the, the flexibility of ticketing and fares, and where the industry is with the, the reduction in revenue that they're currently suffering, then you know those three things put together make, make it very challenging to get people back onto public transport. Um, just sorry, I don't. I look distracted, but certainly because I'm trying to <laughs> try to squeeze in all these questions before we say goodbye to you, and they sort of okay. jumping around on my screen. Um, Alistair says, um, "Pay as you go is great in the right environment, but doesn't work for first class reservations, demand management, etc. And it's scary if you might be charged a lot for not tapping out correctly." What do we think to that, Mike? I think that's probably you could probably answer that, couldn't you? Yeah, I think that, I totally agree. I think that's more or less exactly what I was saying just now. It, it's essentially a, an urban or short distance solution, and I don't think people should kid themselves that customers will love using it for um, or feel trustworthy. You know, it's better to use it for longer distance travel. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big part of the ticketing reforms, but it's not everything. No. Uh, we're drawing to the end of the panel. I'd just like to take a final thought from each of you, actually. We've got about a minute left each. Um, Mark? Do you want to sort of, I don't know, cover whatever I haven't covered, our, our audience haven't covered, any final points or thoughts to make before we move on to the next part of our day? Oh, Mark sorry, Anderson. was it which Mark? Mark Anderson, sorry. <laughs> oh, <thank laughs> I, thought that, I thought my screen had frozen. I was like, oh my goodness, it's frozen. <laughs> um, well, look, I mean, I, I think it's been a, a good discussion around uh, complexity. Uh, for me, this is about uh, restoring confidence. It's about building trust so that not only are we uh, bringing back passengers to the railway, but we're growing rail uh, and shifting more people um, from uh, the car into uh, public transport. So I think that getting this right, getting fares and ticketing right and, and innovating now will be really, really important to um, the growth of the railway overall. So um, that it, we have to listen carefully to passengers and, and manage this com this complexity. Let's make it easy. Duncan, it is all about listening, isn't it? You've done a lot of listening, particularly last year, big national listening exercise. Yeah, it is. And, and, and actually, um... It's, it's understanding what customers want and, and then delivering on that, isn't it? It's about making it simple, making it flexible, giving customers confidence that they've got the right ticket and that actually they've, they've paid the best possible price that they could have paid. Um, I think the time actually is now. Uh, we have a huge opportunity with GBR coming along to, to really make a difference to, to this area and to start to, uh, to deliver. The whole William Shapps plan gives us the blueprint for where we should go and the political backing to, to push this forward. Uh, and it's really up to the industry. And by that, I mean the whole industry, the operators, network rail, the supply chain, everybody, all of our staff to really step into that and, and embrace it and move us forward to uh, to make it easier for customers to, uh, to buy tickets and to travel. Mark Fagan, Mark Anderson and Duncan both used the adjective simple there. Is that is that key, simplifying it, making it easy, making it more straightforward? I think we'll never make it simple or it's going to be very challenging to make it simple. It has to go, you know, be incrementally simpler than it is. I think um, Duncan mentioned 55 million, you know, fares. I mean, that, that number is just mind boggling. So how, how can anyone navigate that so you know you have to get that down by factors very very quickly so, so the velocity that we do this which obviously you know the setting up of gb gbr is going to to help enable um is, is absolutely the right step in the right direction in doing this but but yeah it, it, it's a challenge um but you know there, there are lots of complexities involved in this as we discussed offline some of this might be taxation how, how the, the, the fares are structured compared to other industries or other modes of travel etc as well so it's huge complexity into why things are are charged the way they are a lot of it historic that that as an industry we're going to have to work through and try and resolve mike tuckett no uh, Mike, no pressure here, but uh, you have got the final word. And as you watch your sort of fellow colleagues uh, go to the next bit of the brave new world in rail, um, I'm guessing you'll be watching with interest. And uh, are you sort of on hand to offer any advice from the experience, you know, that TFL's had? Yeah, um, um, sort of generally speaking, 
we, we do play a role in um, you know we sit on the fares and ticketing retail um advisory group and you know always very very willing to share our experience as and when um asked uh, you know but I, I suppose just in the context of this session my main message is the the customer focus is key and you have to fight for it yeah you know this is my experience is people try and drag you away from that there's other pressures like finance legal um you know whatever else you need someone there who's going to say no um this will not be any point to this unless we get it right um for the, for the customers so if, if nothing else that i just like to um, share that from our experience at tfl could, could i could i make a point on that as well helen so so i think you're absolutely right right there's, there's always a reason not to do things and very often as an industry we we go in that direction and find the reason not to do something and, and throw it up there and, and, and stop whatever that innovation is. And we need to break that habit. We really need to start innovating and use the opportunity that we've got right now with GBR coming along um, to to move ourselves forward and to learn from, from uh, the likes of, of TFL, from the likes of what's happening in the Netherlands, from the likes of what's, what's going on with barcode ticketing in the UK um, and make it happen. Got to seize the day, haven't we? Thank you uh, very much to the two Marks, Mike and uh, Duncan. Uh, you've been great panellists and uh, that was a really interesting debate. I hope you'll join us for future ones. Thank you very much for giving up your time today and being here. Uh, next, we're going to move on to our final networking break of the day. One last chance to engage with our speed networking functionality and to see if you're in with a chance to climb your way onto the leaderboard. Or maybe you just want a quick unwind, a quick cup of tea before our next guest and final panel debate. I'll see you back here at, let me look at the clock, I think five to three for the next speaker, who is Steve White. I'll see you then. <laughs>